Hello and welcome to the Midweek Hangout. I'm Warren from the Beast of War team and tonight I'm joining Alessio Cavatori to chat about his brand new Waterloo board game which is coming to Kickstarter and towards the end of the show we're going to have a little bit of a chat about uh, Terminator. Alessio, uh, welcome to the show. Hello, hi, thank you for having me. So, uh, Alessio, brand new uh, board game coming along. Um, uh, this time, Waterloo. Yay! One of my favorite topics. So I'm going to going to wax lyrical tonight. Um, I have a, a nice piece of box art here for us to have a look at. Um, uh, so uh, here we have it. Now, I'd heard you were going to do this a little while ago. Uh, I'm just really pleased that it's now uh, making its appearance. So uh, what can you tell us about it? Um, I know it's going to Kickstarter. Do you want to give us some dates and stuff now so as we know what to expect? Yes, it is going to Kickstarter uh, towards the end of the month. Uh, we haven't quite decided the exact date. And it's going to finish, more importantly, that's the important date, on the 18th of June. 2015. So, 200 years after the battle, in the evening of the 15th, we'll finish the campaign as the campaign for Waterloo finished. So, same date, same moment, same hour. Fantastic. Um, so, do you, do you have an idea? Uh, you've maybe already said it. When, when is the launch date and how long the Kickstarter might run for? Yeah, well, I make a little premise. Basically, as people know, we are really, really busy with Terminator, with the Terminator Genesis game. So, we are really like, Completely, completely taken. And the conversation among the among the brass of Rivers was, well, you know, this this Waterloo thing, which we planned to do years ago, but the, uh, really, uh, it's a bit of it's going to be a small project. So really, why don't we concentrate on the on the Terminator? And, and however, we were debating, humming and hiring whether to do it or not. And then the piece of art that we commissioned already to to Pete uh, arrived. And when we saw that piece of art. Uh, we just, you know, our our, our jaws collectively jaws, completely unhinged and went, oh my god. <laughs> so when we saw that, we went, nope, nope, we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it. It doesn't matter how busy we are, we're gonna do it. Um, it basically, the the geek in us, the the, the historical <laughs> passion, just took over. We went, no, it's just too cool. It's just too cool. And, I, and we thought about postponing it. For a calmer time, I was like, no, 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 the 200 year Waterloo is not gonna come back ever again. So, no, this is the time, this is the time, Maitland. <laughs> so, we, we, we went and decided to do like, it. Waterloo for me is an absolutely fascinating battle. Um, I, I, People will know that I wasn't you know, massively into the historicals. Um, well, I've been. Drag there, kicking and screaming. I'm now totally in love. And uh, Napoleonics, um, the the whole Napoleonic aspect of of, of our industry, um, I didn't quite get until I, I got to the Perrys and I saw one of their big battles and stuff. And I thought, oh, I can see the appeal of this. But it was when I really started to get into Waterloo and understanding that particular battle that it all really started to come together for me. Can you give us, for anybody that's watching this that maybe isn't completely clued in on Waterloo or the significance of Waterloo, can you give us like a, a little two-minute primer for someone who would be new to the battle? Okay, let's assume, yeah, the, you haven't heard too much about Waterloo. A very brief historical setting. So Napoleon is being defeated by a coalition of all the European powers together, eventually after ruling Europe for many years. And he's, uh, he's in exile on Elba and his little islands near Italy. And basically, the king in France is restored, everything seems, you know, is done for. Except that he's in Elba, he has a thousand grenadiers of the old guard, he's, he's got, you know, kind of a, he's the king of the little island of Elba. And decides, after about a year, to not to go back and have a one last gamble, which is, I mean, the subtitle of the game is The Emperor's Last Gamble, because basically he just has this one last hurrah. <laughs> and basically, with his little ship lands in Marseille, near Marseille, uh, and basically the, the the army, the French army that was there, sent to arrest him, you know, to take his thousand guys and put them into jail or shoot them up, etc. Uh, led by Marshal Ney, so one of his one of his captains, one of his marshals. Uh, the moment Marshal Ney and his army face these thousand people led by Napoleon, instead of shooting at him, they just start cheering and bringing him in, basically in train off to Paris. The king flees. 
Napoleon is the emperor of the French again. He starts to rebuild his power. And of course, all of Europe goes, what? <laughs> so again, another coalition led, of course, Britain being one of the foremost powers in there. But there's Austria, there's Russia, Prussia, Sweden. There's all sorts of, basically, <laughs> the entire Europe, once again, starts to build their armies and uh, and basically go and take Napoleon out. And as classic Napoleon style, he decides that actually he's not going to wait for the all huge armies to mass and destroy him because they will have a huge superiority. He decides to attack while they're still massing up. So he attacks first. He goes straight north of France into, into Belgium, where basically the British force, I say British, is actually an English force which has a lot, a lot of allies because all there's basically there's Belgians, there's Dutch, there's a lot of German, small German states that are forming up and under the command of Wellington of the British, which obviously were uh, in at that period probably the best, the best army, uh, smaller in 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 terms of numbers, but very very good army. And, uh, at the moment, Wellington was undefeated as a general, so everybody respected his uh, his, his ability. So he was in charge of his alliance. And uh, steaming through from uh, from the from the east, there's a Prussian army under Marshal Blucher, which is a great character. I'll tell you more about it. But so basically, the Prussians are coming. The 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 Anglo Anglo Dutch call them allies are kind of waiting for for the Prussians. Napoleon, in a few days before, there's a battle at Quatre Bras between Napoleon's army and and the British, and uh, it's kind of a kind of a draw. The British retreat towards Bruxelles. Uh, and uh, then the Prussians also are arriving, and the, the second half of Napoleon army beats them at Ligny. So there's another battle. So these two battles, the, both armies scatter, the Prussians badly, they get sent, thrown back. And basically, the, the French army is divided into two. The main, the bulk of the army with Napoleon goes north towards Bruxelles, because if they take Bruxelles, beat Wellington, beat the British, they may force a, an early surrender of the coalition. So that, that's a big gamble. The Prussians somewhere dissolved somewhere in the east and uh, you know at that period it wasn't clear it wasn't easy to find armies you didn't have satellites uh, airplanes or anything so it's, it's a case of people riding in the countryside finding scattered troops and trying to understand what's going on so the napoleon sent grouchy marshal grouchy with a big part of his army following the, the, the prussians with the with the orders of kind of keep harassing them and you know engaging them and keep them away from the main battle towards towards Bruxelles. And so the next day, uh, Wellington is preparing this defensive line on the, on the terrain of his choice near the near the village uh, the village of Waterloo. And he had, he had picked this spot nearly a year in advance uh, uh, from from what I had read, um, that this particular <clears throat> defensive position um, on the top and at the back uh, of the hill. Is some is a, is an area that he was well aware of and uh, yes. had selected. Yeah, because he, he was uh, famous for picking his ground and uh, fighting battles always in the, the spot where he thought he was he had the advantage. Uh, particularly because the the, the big strength of, one of the big strengths of the French army was the artillery. Napoleon had you know the best the, the terror weapon of the period the, the twelve pounders huge guns. And, so uh, several uh, several thousand of those guns uh, I think were, was thousand, a battle. Absolutely. Maybe yeah. hundred, but yes, yes, the, the, quite a lot. But it wasn't. I mean, the twelve pounders were not many, but they were yeah. uh, pokey. <laughs> it certainly, if you count all the other artillery, six pounders, nine pounders, etc. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of guns there, and the so the British are like you say, Wellington likes to deploy his troops just behind the ridge on the, on the reverse of the slope, so that actually the artillery is not quite as effective against them. And uh, so he picks his ground and basically decides that they have to hold. They have to hold, and basically look east and go, well, the Prussians have promised, Blucher has promised that he will join into the battle. He will come in with his troops. And the British uh, the British and uh, Anglo-Dutch-German alliance has is outnumbered, outgunned by the French, but not by much. And while with the Prussians, they would outnumber the French, of course. They would outnumber the French in, again, and uh, they, would, they would have the, the, the advantage in numbers. So Napoleon... Basically, wants to crush the British as soon as possible, utter defeat, destroy that army so that they can deal with the Prussians later, and or just hope that Grouchy does enough to, to keep them out of, of, the, of the picture. Well, uh, history tells us that what happened instead was that Grouchy went the wrong way and uh, didn't engage and uh, actually resisted a lot of... Uh, 
apparently pressure from his other officers to actually, uh, because they were hearing the guns going off at Waterloo, and they thought, well, we need to march to the sound of the guns. You know, the emperor is fighting. Let's, you know, let's go there. And which is like, no, no, I have my orders. We're going that way. Yeah, that's where the Prussians will be. So basically, they don't get there in time, and instead the Prussians do. Chest yeah. in the nick of time, just as the, the British lines were, you know, spent lots of units without ammunition, <laughs> torn to pieces on, on both sides. But obviously, the French were pretty much about to deliver the, the final blow at the end of the day, and suddenly the pressures turn up and uh, yeah, basically it turns into a major defeat. Just in the nick of time, and as you said, it is a astonishing battle. It is we chose to do because it's yeah, to, to start our rule set, if you want, at the first adventure for our board game rule set into Waterloo because well, it is the battle, isn't it? You know, if you mm. ask people in the streets, name a battle. Yeah. Name any battle in history ever. Name one battle. Anybody in the street. Obviously, not everybody would say Waterloo, but... Plenty would, though. I mean, the majority the, would. One of the most fast fascinating aspects of uh, of the Battle of Waterloo was the geopolitical nature of that battle. We still feel the effects today um, of that battle, you know, and without getting into conspiracy theories and, and the likes, but, you know, uh, Waterloo it, it was, for me anyway, reading it, it felt like a little bit of a birth of that whole military industrial complex thing that we talk, uh, that we talk about where, you know, banks make money from war. Um, from what I can gather, you know, like the Rothschild Bank financed both sides to some degree and got a message early at the London Stock Exchange that Wellington had won the battle, sold off. Uh, English bonds, uh, created a run on English bonds, the value of them dropped through the floor, bought them all up, and uh, pretty much ended up controlling banking in Europe ever since. And uh, th that kind of thing has then kind of stepped through even into the wars we fight today. You know, it's uh, the, the, There's money in war, Alessio. It's Just not in war gaming. <laughs> 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 we picked the wrong end, man. <laughs> but um, so that that's that uh, that's a that's a that's great little primer for Waterloo, guys. You know, it's um, you know, you might think it's old and stuffy. Uh, some of you guys that have maybe come from a background similar to myself, but when you get into it and you start to to look into this, it is utterly fascinating. And some of the the tactical aspects of the battle where, you know, uh, how do you deal with a cavalry charge when all you are is a bunch of men with bayonets? You know, it's um, it, it's fascinating how the, all that was dealt with. Now, Alessio, tell us a little bit about the artwork again. Um, uh, who created the artwork? Peter Dennis. Peter Dennis. Peter Dennis, which you, I'm sure, recognize from a lot of Osprey books, from a lot of uh, boxes of toy soldiers, uh, Paris, Warlord. Yeah. Peter has been a seminar artist in wargaming. You know, for me, whenever I think artwork for any books that I work with in historical bolt action, you know, particularly bolt action, I guess, but all of the all of the warlords range and and the Paris, uh, uh, you know, the, he is the artist. <coughs> Obviously, not everything, but a lot of it is his. And mm -hmm. uh, to me, it evokes the old toy soldiers, you know, boxes of toy soldiers, boxes of uh, of gaminess. So uh, definitely, and he is also a great guy to work with. He's a, a fantastic guy, and uh, so it was it was awesome. And we asked him to do the, the main cover and uh, the counters and the the board for the game. And part of the Kickstarter reason is that, frankly, obviously at the moment we have the minimum setup of art. So you know, all British infantry counters have a British soldier. So if you look, you have the images of those counters? Yep. So um, sure these you... are the counters here. Yeah. So say there's a you know, British infantry there, French infantry, French cavalry. So we have one piece of art per counter. Ultimately, what would be uber cool would be to have every unit different or at least some troop types different, guard units different from in line infantry. You know, obviously add detail. Uh, you will see, again, there's a lot of cards. Uh, there's a lot mm -hmm. of uh, basically uh, the, the card drive the system, and at the moment is their text, you know, beautifully laid out, colorful, etc. But text. If I could have all of the cards illustrated, <laughs> a little diagram, a little battle scenes, that would be fantastic. So really, that's one yeah. of the reasons uh, we went for Kickstarter, just to gauge, you know, how much interest there is, how much you know passion we we'll, we can summon, and see whether we we can basically make it richer and richer and richer in terms of artwork. That would be the kind mm -hmm. of the first 
way, the first development of a Kickstarter. People have asked already when we put a little teaser out that, oh, it's going to be a miniature game. I'm like, no, no, it's not a miniature game. It's a traditional board game. So hexes, cardboard counters, uh, two sided cardboard counters. Uh, but, and that's where it will start. If it goes amazingly well beyond the realms of, I think it's unlikely, but if it went really well, then we would start to think about making these counters maybe stand up and fit inside the little plastic base so that you have standee plastic, you know, cardboard standees going around. If it went very well, then it could go into toy soldiers, of course. But, I mean, obviously, we all would love to, to go there, but I make I, it go well. I want toy soldiers. <laughs> well, frankly, I suppose people can just exchange the counters for toy soldiers if one wanted to, as in literally, you yeah. know, buy some. Various plastics and <laughs> lots of stuff and do the thing. Well, let's talk a little bit about the game. I, I have, uh, I have, for example, here a picture of the board, Alessio. Do you want to start taking us through a little bit about you know what the style of the game is, you know, and how you're how yeah. you're capturing the feel um, yes. of the Battle of Waterloo? Yes, the game is a divisional level board game. Uh, so basically, there's not a lot of counters. There's not a lot of counters. Each counter is a huge amount of men, horses, guns, etc. I kept it really simple. There is no stacking, for example. You know, like in some games, old style games, you have like piles of counters. Now, this is like a division takes a hex. So it's as big, you know, these counters are always bigger than what they will be. But imagine that one of those fits pretty much neatly inside one of those hexes. So there is no overlapping. And that makes that it actually looks pretty. You can always see what your units are. So, and more importantly, there's, you don't have a lot of counters. The French player has 20 some, the British like around 20, the Prussian even less. So uh, it, the old thing is I wanted to, something that feels a bit reminiscent of those old board games we played when we were younger, you know, Avalon Hill, etc. But the system, it look, looks prettier looks prettier because just the, there's fewer counters, but they're better illustrated. They're more gorgeous looking. And the system is card driven. There's a kind of a card mechanic game, which makes it uh, fairly entertaining because the, the cards are the commanders. You have the, you know, the Wellington, Ney, all the famous commanders, and they activate units of their own core, the, the color and command. Uh, and there are cards we call stratagem cards, which are kind of, random things that you put in and you can keep in play at the right moment example and they're all funny quotes really they're all quotes from either history or from famous movies about waterloo uh you know there's the there's the british card uh, wounded commander card which goes uh, by god sir i've lost my leg by god sir so you have <laughs> apparently a quote from, from real history uh, or basically one of the british commanders gets taken out for a while or, or, or apparently so there's a lot of these, you know, uh, you have to put up an accent, of course, when you read these cards. You have to go, you know, like, uh, you have the French card going, oh, maybe, but we will mash him with our lancers, kind of thing, you know. <clears throat> you have to do these things. Yes, that's Napoleon. So you have to do your best Napoleon or your best Wellington, yeah? <laughs> Indeed. Like your best Blucher. I mean, there's some quotes from Blucher, which are amazing. He was famous for being a rough, rough, tough, you know, hussar, cavalry officer, you know, the, when he rides into, into battle, goes, Right, raise the black flag, children. Raise the black flag. Uh, basically, the, the black flag meaning we are not taking prisoners. So <laughs> raise the black flag. Uh, if I see, do not show any pity. If I see any men with pity in them, I will shoot them myself. <laughs> so it was the, <laughs> the nice atmosphere of the film. Like, no prisoners taken. So uh, there's a lot of cool stuff from history. Obviously, uh, researching this game was fantastic to get the old divisions right. Uh, so division on level, simple system really in the sense that you know old war games tended to have charts you tot up the points here you tot up the points there you do a kind of a ratio of strength and then you roll on the chart nothing at all like that this is basically units of a number of dice they roll in a way obviously because it's me i kind of i suppose i kind of designed a war game <laughs> it's, a, it's a little war game really divisional board game version of a war game uh, you can see the map. Actually, on these pictures of the map, you cannot see. There's a lot of. Uh, there's a few more uh, roads, smaller roads, uh, linking those villages, etc. But what you can see is the main two roads, because they are kind of the most important objectives. You can see on the on the eastern side the Prussian arrival area, which is uh, is random, both in terms of time and in terms of uh, location. To keep that 
mist war cloud in the distance that you quite don't know whether it's Grouchy with his with his French army or it is the Prussians. So we kept that slightly random. So there is a bit of that atmosphere of Waterloo. You don't know when they're coming in. The British are trying to hold and resist until they come in, and because it's really uphill, the battle is really difficult for the British at the beginning. Uh, now, one of, the, one of the, the key things about the battlefield is you had Le Hesson and the Hougamont, the, the two kind of uh, farmhouses on either side of the battlefield. Um, is that on the board? You know, is, is, are battles taking place over those? Yes, yes. The Hougamont and La Hesson are, are both there, of course, and uh, Papelotte and all the famous uh, defensible areas. And even the ridge is there, uh, the famous ridge. Uh, and the uh, the like we find when we play testing the game that uh, actually there are really two things you can do with, with those uh, as, the, as the French player because for the French you're, you're you're against time you need to be as fast as possible to crush the British because if you wait time is not your friend um, so you have a choice really of either bypassing those because they start with a little garrison unless the British player sends reinforcement they they're so you either bypass them ignore them just ignore them because they're defensive they're, they're difficult to take or just you know, mass everything and the, everybody their dog and just flatten them, you know, huge, huge concentration of power. But, but basically, don't make the mistake that was made in history of just sending troops piecemeal, kind of quite a lot of guys, but not all together, not all decisively, you know, kind of like with a proper commitment. Or I would say, ignore them or go for it. Don't kind of... Do they have a strategic advantage in the game, uh, Alessio, like they had on the day? Oh yeah, no, they're, they're really tough to take uh, because basically the, I mean, Hugomont particularly because uh, La Sainte was obviously a, a farm, yeah, a, a farm, a big farm, while Hugomont was a chateau. So actually thicker walls, uh, more compact, almost built for defense. So they are really, really difficult, particularly Hugomont, but they're really, really difficult. Any troops in there are really, really tough to dislodge or kill. So, but, you know, you can do it. You know, I've, I've played a few times and uh, I tend to use a, <laughs> I just one of the first options is gamble. It's a very risky tactic. It's just to go Imperial Guard, take you home. <laughs> so you have the old guards storming you. <laughs> You're right. It's ours. Move on, <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, but that's a gamble uh, because obviously, like in reality, if you commit the guard, uh, you have basically you're using your best units. The, the old yes. guard division is the is the best unit in the game. However. <laughs> If that unit or any guard unit gets uh, gets a retreat result of wars, then the entire French army starts to go, oops. <laughs> and, and we know from history that if you leave it too long before you use the, the old guard. Yep. Yes, indeed. It, it, uh, you, you lose your opportunity. Yes. And one thing I didn't say, actually, when you're talking about historical uh, deployment is uh, this game is... The one I described, uh, this, this the system, but the, the way to play, there's actually two ways to play this game. First way is what we call the historical way, where basically uh, there's a setup chart, set of map, where you have all the units uh, deployed as they started. Uh, so you kind of have all the division in the position where they started, and and you play from there. So effectively, is is basically like a puzzle, and it's almost like chess in the sense that this is a starting position. Play. Oh, you, you were defeated. Well, play again. You know, try try. Try to ignore Yugomont instead of taking it and see what happens. Try to go for the right flank, the left flank, the center. You know, send this unit, uh, commit the guard early, don't commit the guard early. You know, keep the guard to face the pressure. Whatever. You, 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 have, you can try different ways of breaking that puzzle. And that's one way of playing the game. And, but to ensure uh, replayability and a bit of fun and difference, we have a different version. There's like an appendix that says, uh, if you like that and you play that, but now you want something different, you can play the night before the battle version oh night, the night before the battle and i'm sure you know basically uh, the, the armies were advancing in in the middle of a huge downpour rain everywhere couldn't see anything so basically kind of stumbled back to their positions made camp prepared soup <laughs> and then just waited for a little to, to, to stop raining kind of thing so what you do in this if you decide to play that way uh, you have only uh core commanders which represent kind of the position of the core and you start to move on to the map and so is the enemy. So you're kind of going for the setup, trying to find a nice place, a nice position to, to start the battle the next day. And you have like blips, which are kind of units of scouts. We imagine like, you know, in the dark, a few shots, you, keep, you see some enemies, you don't know what, what's happening, and you just decide to stop for the night and set up camp. And that's where you start the next day. So there is a kind of a 
uh, a mini game, if you want, before the battle, where you you change the position. So the, the original setup could be completely different. You know, you, the, you can only start in French hands, but the British are a lot closer. You know, to the to the, to the east side. So maybe the British are not on the ridge; they are next to the the Prussians coming in, or maybe they're opposite. They are opposite the Prussians, trying to funnel the French in the middle. So th there's a lot of different ways of playing it, and. Uh, I think it's bet it's easier for the British in that uh, the night before the battle, and that's again is from history because Wellington, when he deployed his troops, he didn't deploy with the intention of maneuvering. He just went. <laughs> in the middle, there's a Simpson movie. There's a bit in the Simpsons movie where there's a bit again. I want ten thousand tough guys and ten thousand soft guys, and I want to blame like this: tough guy, soft guy, tough guy, soft guy, tough guy. Because the tough guy will, will make, so the soft guy will make the tough guys look tougher. <laughs> so he does something like that. Basically, he deploys his troops static, not by cars, not the idea of maneuvering. It's kind of all mixed up, really. The artillery is scattered all over the place. So, um, so. By actually doing the night before the battle, corps start a bit more coherent because they start kind of around their commander. Yeah. Which means actually, the British are a bit more in control and they can play a bit more of a maneuvering game. While actually, in the historical game, they're very much kind of going. So, as a British, the feeling is: all right, there's this huge thing coming at you, deployed by corps, the best troops in the period, you know, the Imperial, Imperial Guard coming at you. You're going to go right. Hold, hold, hold. Oh my God, they're just squashing our right flank. Send some troops there. So you, you kind of send your little reserves in, and as they get caught, <laughs> as they get crushed by the, by the French, and you pray, and you and you look left, and you look to east, and go, come on, come on now, anytime now. Oh my God, I lost another unit. Oh my, <laughs> you know, there is that, there is that feeling that, you know, one more turn and I'm done for if they don't arrive. And, so, and we, the way we did that really is um, the, the break point of the of the. I mean, if you go on the map again, if you can show the map, um, that picture uh, on the you see break point on the left of the of the instructions there. So mm -hmm. you got forty five break point for the French. This is how many points of troops you need to kill. So when you kill forty five paint, uh, forty five fighting points of French, the, the French army uh, collapses and the French lose. Uh, 30 points of British. So the French have to kill 30 points of British before the Prussians arrive. The moment the Prussians, the first Prussian unit appears on the map, the combined yeah. factor 50. of the map yeah. is 50. So suddenly, instead of being easier for you to crush them, it's easier for them to crush you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you because they, they obviously take heart in the fact that their allies are there. And, and of course, you have units on, on your side that start to take your, your roll up your line. So it's... Uh, it does that swingy moment and you know say if you look at the the calendar uh five turn five prussian fourth corps arrives on a five plus ah yes so as as the turns progress it's more likely that the prussians right. are going to so end up seven, coming in. So yeah. turn seven prussian fourth corps arrives automatically first corps arrives on a five plus second corps arrives on a five. so yeah in theory you can resist until turn seven <laughs> yeah but of course, there are other things you can do. I mean, the British have cards like uh, "Give me Knight" or "Give me Blucher," which makes it, you know, make you reroll the dice and stuff like that. So there's, there are things you can do to try to speed it up. And of course, tactically, you can, you know, as the French player, you can decide to just concentrate everything against the British or leave some troops to kind of stop the the Prussians when they arrive in those woods. Kind of go, all right, I'll try to funnel them in those woods so they slow down and keep them at bay for a while. They're gonna crush these units, which I leave there to. Normally, it's the sixth. The, the French Sixth Corps normally it's their job to <laughs> to do this, you know, stop the Prussians just long enough for the for the Imperial Guard to destroy the British kind of thing to finish the job, and so yeah, there's there's a lot of variety there, and uh, <clears throat> as you can see, the eleventh turn sometimes is played, sometimes it isn't, so you don't know exactly when is you know night will descend and the battle will end. Can you redeploy? Uh, uh, like, um. I'm being terrible at my job here, but I can't stop thinking about the possibilities of this game. <laughs> and so I, I'm already thinking in terms of unleash all the artillery, get that out of the way, send Marshal Ney in straight away, and uh, send the Imperial Guard into Hougamont. Uh, if they take Hougamont, can they then progress from there, or, do, or are they stuck in Hougamont? Yeah, no, no, of course they can go forward from Hougamont. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, but you have to be aware, of, of course, just north of Hougamont, 
is the is Maitland and his first infantry division, the, the British Guards, up there. So uh, basically, again, this is the second toughest unit in the game. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Even your imperial, even your old guard. You know, if the if the British Guards are still fresh, I mean, they've not been damaged or anything. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost an even fight there. So. You, uh, we've seen people you know, with Maitland and his guards to to actually enter Hugomont with the, all of the British Guard division, which obviously is impossible. But that assumes that they are setting up the center of the defense there, and so that's an important one: is divisional. So there is an element of abstraction. So, for example, the strength of the units is not just based on the because I went and researched the number of men they had, and so I went, okay, each ten thousand men, each thousand men is this. One one dice you roll, and then but then I have to adjust because every, every division had some artillery attached to the division, division of artillery. So again, based on the number of guns, I increase the number of dice. Then quality has a part. You know, some elite troops get an extra dice, while crappy troops, uh, conscript troops, maybe they get less dice. So it's it's been an interesting exercise. Uh, and, uh, the, the game has some abstractions in, of course, to work as a divisional. So, you know, every counter is like, <laughs> it could be ten, tens of thousands of men, you know, with hundreds of guns, etc. So it's, you know, it's fairly abstract in terms of uh, scale, but that allows it, the, the beautiful thing is then you have 20 pieces to, wor to worry about. You don't have, you know, <laughs> 300 pieces to worry about. You're just like, ah, brain. <laughs> <laughs> well, divisional games are, are much appreciated by the community on BC4. We had a community member, Oriskane, who has uh, uh, made it his job to bring us up to speed with the levels of gaming. So it's um, I, I can imagine a lot of our viewers are, are looking at this and going, yeah, I, I get the divisional side. I'm totally on board with that. Unless you have a couple of basics, okay? How many players for the game? Well, two, normally. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, if you wanted to, you could split uh, forces. You could say, well, you're in charge. You could almost almost have the entire uh, French general staff and the British staff, because basically the, the command cards have uh, all the staff, all the core commanders, uh, all the division commanders. However, really, it's a two-player game. It's a two-player yeah. game. You can do funny things. You could have a third player to be the Prussians. You know, that's kind of probably the easiest way of splitting things. Uh, but again, the poor guy may a never play. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he'll have a lot of pints to drink while he's waiting anyway. So, and then, and then he may. I just obviously, I, I think basically the real answer is a two-player game. It's a two-player game. You can. How long to... does the game last, Alessio? When you're play testing, how long have you you find the game taking? Uh, it, there's an interesting point with that. If the French, I think, if an, a skilled French player, because a hesitant French player, there's one that goes up with caution, normally makes the game last a lot longer because past the fifth, seventh turn, it, it basically, it's almost like half of your games will finish fairly quickly because the French will win, will break the British and uh, before the Prussians arrive. In which case you go, right, that's a fairly fast game. Five turns, six turns, you know, uh, Depends how good you are with the rules. An hour, max, an hour and a half, I don't know, something like that, maybe. Yeah, considering the problem and everything, let's be honest. Because actual gameplay maybe is half an hour, but then if you do the historical setup, you have to do the, you, mm -hmm. have to, you know, to look at the map and deploy. If you're doing the, the other one, the, the night before the battle, you have the mini game. So consider the mini game or the historical setup, I would say at least an hour in the fastest cases. Uh, if, if the French, so if the Prussians arrive, that takes longer because obviously, then the Fr unless the French then get defeated quickly, it will take some some time for the you're frozen. Are you still there? Hello, <laughs> hello, Warren. Are we live? <laughs> um, hello. I see a frozen Warren. Um, okay, so Beast of War had a power cut, apparently. The question is whether I'm still alive or not. <laughs> <laughs> Does it mean I'm going to ask Warren to see? <laughs> Is the thing still live? <laughs> That'll be funny. 
Still alive? Waiting for an answer. <laughs> Getting messages here. Ah, it is still alive. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. So we lost Mr. Warren, it's just the Alessio show. Okay. <clears throat> yes, Waterloo. I was talking about uh, Warren says that he's going to come back. So unless he tells me otherwise, I'll continue. This is funny. Mm, I have the entire audience for me. Mm, what can I say? We never liked Warren, did we? No, no. Waterloo. Um, yes, the, if the Prussians come in, the game lasts longer. Uh, obviously. Uh, so I got a message from Warren. He says, yes, you're live. <laughs> mm. <laughs> okay. Well, I can uh, spend some time, I suppose, showing you the... Uh, if I do a screen share, I'll entertain you while we wait for Warzone to come back. And I will show you some stuff. So we have... Okay, can you see? I don't know whether you can see that. I hope you can see this. Okay, so that being the... Artwork, the original artwork for the game. Then we have Portrait of Napoleon for the Corps Commander. Uh, the cover of the game. And what, you know, a kind of a Photoshop construction of what, what the game is going to be like. And to finish off the map, we have seen a plenty counters. Obviously, a British infantry damaged counter. And let's get one that is not damaged, like that one. And I'll show you the information on the counter. British infantry, 5th Infantry Division. Uh, combat strength five. I it rolls five dice. Movement two movement points, and this is just which core it belongs to. So that's the reserve core. Well done, Alessio, keeping oh. it live. <laughs> 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 Sorry about that, folks. We had a power cut there, and the, the machines all decided to to restart themselves. So um, <laughs> we've managed to get back up. Now, just let me turn this one off now, so if we're not sucking up bandwidth. All right. It's funny. I was uh, I was showing people the counters, and I was going into detail of what information there is on the counters. Basically, uh, uh, proceed, <laughs> proceed. You were doing an excellent job. I'm sorry for interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, I think we're done. I mean, just shown that it's as simple as that. So it's a well. Um, if people want to get notified, um, uh, you can go to water waterloo dot launch rock dot com. Um, for a notification of whenever that Kickstarter goes live. Alessio, there's also a Facebook page that you've set up for it. It's um, facebook.com forward slash Alessio Waterloo, I believe. Uh, yeah, that's that's the Facebook page, and I literally just set it up. So we'll, we'll populate it in the next few days. <laughs> the moment is a bit barren, but it's there. So if you join it, you'll see the bits we will upload. Grand. Now, just bear with me, folks. I'm just trying to get uh, logged back into the chat here on Beasts of War, um, so as I can get access to the to the questions. Um, so, Alessio, yes. Um, other than Waterloo, the other big project that you're working on is, of course, uh, Terminator. Um, now, the the game is um, is really getting there. You were demoing it at Salute. Um, how did Salute go for you? <laughs> it was astonishing. I, I mean, I have seen uh, on my skin the difference between doing kind of uh, little indie games, which is what I've been doing the last couple of years, and going back to working on major licenses. You know, it reminded me of the days of Lord of the Rings. It, it was that, you know, four deep ranks of people kind of going, ah, taking pictures, wanting to... Basically, it was exhausting. We, we didn't stop. Me and Matt basically kept talking and demoing, you know, 
all the time. There was no stopping, and which, you know, kind of I'm having a sandwich while I'm trying to drink a coffee and continue to demo because I cannot stop kind of thing. It was outstanding. It was great. It's great. You know, as I said, very tiring, but very, very exciting. And there was a lot of uh, passion. So, yeah, it's it great. It's fantastic. <laughs> So um, uh, I believe in the Warlord newsletter uh, this morning, there was a uh, a new sneak peek of this guy. <laughs> yes, yes, quite a uh, quite in his in his age, <laughs> but uh, still looking tough, doesn't he? Yes, yes. yes. So um, we managed to get a, get a hold of some uh, some sculpts of uh, Arnie. Uh, Lesia, what can you what can you tell us about it? So they're greens, obviously. Yes, the greens by Michael Perry. Yes, no less. Yes, Michael uh, has done uh, has done Arnie, has done uh, Rees, and uh, is now working on uh, Sarah. Mm hmm. And we, I think we have Arnie from a couple of different angles here. He's a mean looking hombre, isn't he? Yes. And uh, there's a few more pictures on the Facebook page. Come and join us uh, on the Terminator Genesis miniatures game, please, on Facebook. For all the new bits, uh, oh, actually, there's a new, new, new bit that you guys will have in total exclusive at the end of this. Yes, uh, we're going to be uploading this shortly, guys. Alessio has sent us across um, uh, a, a kind of a quick start guide. So there's uh, the rules reference sheet and quick play reference, and then on the other side, or on page two, um, we have the model stats and the weapon references. So Alessio, do you want to talk us a wee bit through what we're looking at here? Yeah, this is a, is a first. Basically, we are uh, basically giving you this first, and then, of course, uh, we'll follow it up later on our pages. But this is the reference sheet. This is the cardboard piece of, uh, of information sheet that you get in the in, in the board in in the box. And on one side, you have a quick you know a quick, quick breakdown of the rules. But obviously, because it's not a rules heavy game, by just reading those that page you can pretty much start to play have a quick uh, quite a good go at playing with infantry uh, the vehicles are not there but again this game this first edition is certainly very much focused on infantry you know vehicles are in the advanced roles they're not being play tested as much as the infantry so this also because the range is you know we are starting with the infantry <laughs> but you know we're not that rich so there's the the rules there's the on the if you go back on the previous page so you see, on the on the left is the rules reference. On the on the right is the effectively the, the staff and rules, special rules for all the units in the in the box, in the actual box. Uh, and if you uh, then go on the back of the sheet, thank you. Uh, you have the model stats. So those are the stats of the models included in the in the game. Uh, resistance USA. Uh, then the vehicles. And some people are really happy when they saw the vehicles. And you see the list. Abrams, MBT, Bradley, APC, car, Humvee, pickup truck, <laughs> Apache, attack helicopter, Black Hawk, transport helicopter, and oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then the machines, which obviously have yeah. their own stuff as well. Spider tank. There's been quite a few pictures of the spider tank going up on Facebook recently because they just made the uh, Skydance Paramount just made a big poster of it, and it's quite funky. And the spider tank is going to be the first big kit we're going to do if the game is successful. Basically, if, if we have enough cash to make the kits and uh, invest and make proper kits then the spider tank will be the first oh and, fantastic and the hunter killers of course are there the flying ones the ground ones and uh, then the weapons uh for both sides so that that's really i mean if you want to look at the stat you can see how uh, this is not very complicated <laughs> resistance soldier at the very top skill mm -hmm. green armor four plus resolution yellow Special rules. <laughs> so nice and simple. Well, it's because the the dice are all color coded. The set of dice that goes with it. Frankly, for me, I call that the, the, the river horse set of dice because I intend for me to stick with those dice with those colors throughout any games I do. So and, this is is this a, the beginnings of a of a game engine that well, you're putting together, Alessio? In, in my case, the the miniature wargaming river horse style. This is what I want to do. This is what I'll do. And if I ever do another game for another system, uh, we might have something in the pipeline for next year, another license, but uh, that's not there now. Uh, and uh, it would be the same system, not identical system, but you know, some of the principles like this would be there. So the, your skill, how good you are, is the dice you roll, green, and it's green. So it's easily, there's a shape, there's a color, <laughs> there's a shape for colorblind people, and there's a color. There's a shape, the D6. The D6 you roll is green. It's actually yeah. a green D6. The, the D8, 
your role is a yellow D8 and that's the thing. So color, image, immediately, to, it is very immediate. And as you see, everything has got three stats. <laughs> three stats, uh, including the guns. The guns have three stats as well. This is something I'm quite enamored with. Um, and we, we haven't... We haven't seen as much of it in this industry as I would like, the idea of these underlying engines that when somebody gets used to playing that engine, um, uh, they can approach a number of games and and have a fair idea of what they're getting into. Um, uh, obviously, there'll be some differences, some tweaks of flavor and whatnot's there. But you know, it's been working in video games for uh, for years. We have Unreal Engine, the Crytek Engine. You know, it's um, it, it it makes perfect sense to me that we we start to see these kinds of things um, enter into the uh, to the industry, especially now that we're getting so much choice. Because we have a lot of choice of games, we want to play a lot of games, but we don't have time to go through 60-page rule books or 200-page rule books um, every time we want to pick up a new game. Yep. Well, you know, we've seen that with uh, X-Wing and, uh, and uh, the, the Star Wars one, uh, sorry, the Star Trek one, you know, the, the mm. fact that they, they have the same effect, the same engine. You know, if, if people want to use our rules for their war games, I'm sure we can talk. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> that is if they're good, of course, or they may be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so Alessio, to give us a final update, when uh, when are we looking at the launch and the release of uh, the Terminator box set? When are people going to be able to put their money down for this? Now, uh, as in World of Games, uh, which are the they have the contract to distribute it in the entire known universe. Um, <laughs> they, they they already put it for pre-orders. They put up the the starter set for pre-order uh, and the well. Call it status set is out of habit, but it's really is a is a game in a box, really, because you can there's in that box there's everything you need to play, and there's about fifty scenarios you can play. So really, you can play that for years and not, don't need to go anywhere else. I suspect most people, particularly if you're a war game rather than a board game, of course you're gonna go no, no, I don't need this. Things. Need more minis. <laughs> I, I want, I want the, the big with the tape measure. I want the big six by four table and and the tanks, etc. And you can do that. The, the thing is, the rules are work on both. You know, you can use the same rules on. on there's not. There's a couple of pages in the rule book which tell you exactly how to go about. You know, throw away your sticks and instead your measuring template and instead using the the tape measure. Mm -hmm. So it's. Uh, so yes, that's that's. There, but it gets into, into a bigger war game, and there's a range of products. And war games will obviously start to put them as soon as we make them, because basically we are in the you know get all the components in, assemble them, package them, get them ready to go. And uh, I think next week everything going touch wood. Next week the actual boxes should start shipping out from Warlord. Uh, so. Right, Ooh. Alessio, <laughs> we need to get you over. Uh, is there any chance that we can get you over, get you onto the show, and get you to show off this game so as we can see how it plays? Well, it would be delightful to be there. Uh, ideally, it, we could do a show a bit of Waterloo, show a bit of Terminator, maybe do some of the bolt action. Keep right. Well, we we will do our best to make that happen. <laughs> okay, guys, uh, we are going to call it. It's now um, coming up to a quarter past the hour. Alessio, look, you thank you so much for joining us. I just want to quickly go back over it, guys. If you want to keep uh, in abreast of what's happening with the Waterloo game, go and check out uh, facebook.com forward slash uh, Alessio Waterloo. Otherwise, you can uh, put your details into waterloo.launchrock.com. Uh, there's also a Facebook page for the Terminator game. It's, uh, what is it, Terminator Genesis? The Miniatures Game. The Miniatures Game. Okay, Alessio, look, thank you so much for joining us. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. We're going to take you up on that offer and get you over to the studio so as we can get a proper deep look at this Terminator game. I want, to, I want you back. <laughs> it has to be done, <laughs> really, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, uh, thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions for Alessio, put them in the, the comments below this video or come on over to the Beast 4 chat. And if there's anything we missed, we'll do our best to get Alessio to answer it. We are going to be putting up those rules uh, intimately now onto the website. So come on over to beastofwar.com and click on this post.
host that this video is connected to. And in there, you will find a link to be able to download the rules uh, for the Terminator game and check them out and see what you think. Uh, once again, thank you to everybody that's joined us tonight. Next week, I have Ronnie Renton on the show, who's going to be talking about all of his love for Kings of War, no doubt he'll be talking about all his love for all sorts of things, because you know what Ronnie's like when we get him on the show. So uh, stay tuned for that. Sorry, Alessio? He's going to talk about dwarves, isn't he? <laughs> uh, he, he is, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> So if you have questions for Ronnie that you'd like to get in in advance, and I'll make sure we ask them, make sure and uh, put them into the comments uh, beneath this video. Once again, thank you for watching, and we'll see you on a midweek hangout next week. Cheers, guys.